The Poor Claire, by Elizabeth Gaskell, Part 3. The link for Part 1 and 2 are in the description below. But you know that you have something to learn about me yet. I only want to say this, I shall not think less of you, less well of you, I mean if you, too, fall away from me when you know all. Stop! said she, as if fearing another burst of mad words. Listen to me. My father is a man of great wealth. I never knew my mother, she must have died when I was very young. When first I remember anything, I was living in a great, lonely house, with my dear and faithful Mistress Clark. My father, even, was not there, he was, he is, a soldier, and his duties lie aboard. But he came from time to time, and every time I think he loved me more and more. He brought me rarities from foreign lands, which proved to me now how much he must have thought of me during his absences. I can sit down and measure the depth of his lost love now, by such standards as these. I never thought whether he loved me or not then, it was so natural, that it was like the air I breathed. Yet he was an angry man at times, even then, but never with me. He was very reckless, too, and, once or twice, I heard a whisper among the servants that a doom was over him, and that he knew it, and tried to drown his knowledge in wild activity, and even sometimes, sir, in wine. So I grew up in this grand mansion, in that lonely place. Everything around me seemed at my disposal, and I think everyone loved me, I am sure I loved them. Till about two years ago, I remember it well, my father had come to England to us, and he seemed so proud and so pleased with me and all I had done. And one day his tongue seemed loosened with wine, and he told me much that I had not known till then, how dearly he had loved my mother, yet how his willful usage had caused her death, and then he went on to say how he loved me better than any creature on earth, and how, some day, he hoped to take me to foreign places, for that he could hardly bear these long absences from his only child. Then he seemed to change suddenly, and said, in a strange, wild way, that I was not to believe what he said, that there was many a thing he loved better, his horse, his dog, I know not what. And t'was only the next morning that, when I came into his room to ask his blessing as was my wont, he received me with fierce and angry words. Why had I, so he asked, been delighting myself in such one in mischief, dancing over the tender plants in the flower beds, all set with the famous Dutch bulbs he had brought from Holland? I had never been out of doors that morning, sir, and I could not conceive what he meant, and so I said, and then he swore at me for a liar, and said I was of no true blood, for he had seen me doing all that mischief himself, with his own eyes. What could I say? He would not listen to me, and even my tears seemed only to irritate him. That day was the beginning of my great sorrows. Not long after, he reproached me for my undue familiarity, all on becoming a gentlewoman, with his grooms. I had been in the stable yard, laughing and talking, he said. Now, sir, I am something of a coward by nature, and I had always dreaded horses, besides that, my father's servants, those whom he brought with him from foreign parts, were wild fellows, whom I had always avoided, and to whom I had never spoken, except as a lady must needs from time to time speak to her father's people. Yet my father called me by names of which I hardly know the meaning, but my heart told me they were such as shame any modest woman, and from that day he turned quite against me, nay, sir, not many weeks after that, he came in with a riding whip in his hand, and, accusing me harshly of evil doings, of which I knew no more than you, sir, he was about to strike me, and I, all in bewildering tears, was ready to take his stripes as great kindness compared to his harder words, when suddenly he stopped his arm and way, gasped and staggered, crying out, the curse, the curse. I looked up in terror. In the great mirror opposite I saw myself, and right behind, another wicked, fearful self, so like me that my soul seemed to quiver within me, as though not knowing to which similitude of body it belonged. My father saw my double at the same moment, either in its dreadful reality, whatever that might be, or in the scarcely less terrible reflection in the mirror, but what came of it at that moment I cannot say, for I suddenly swooned away, and when I came to myself I was lying in my bed, and my faithful clerk sitting by me. I was in my bed for days, and even while I lay there my double was seen by all, flitting about the house and gardens, always about some mischievous or detestable work. What wonder that every one shrank from me in dread, that my father drove me forth at length, when the disgrace of which I was the cause was past his patience to bear. Mistress Clark came with me, and here we try to live such a life of piety and prayer as may in time set me free from the curse. All the time she had been speaking, I had been weighing her story in my mind. I had hitherto put cases of witchcraft on one side, as mere superstitions, and my uncle and I had had many an argument, he supporting himself by the opinion of his good friend Sir Matthew Hale. Yet this sounded like the tale of one bewitched, or was it merely the effect of a life of extreme seclusion telling on the nerves of a sensitive girl? My skepticism inclined me to the latter belief, and when she paused I said, I fancy that some physician could have disabused your father of his belief in visions. 
Just at that instant, standing as I was opposite to her in the full and perfect morning light, I saw behind her another figure, a ghastly resemblance, complete in likeness, so far as form and feature and minutest touch of dress could go, but with a loathsome demon soul looking out of the grey eyes, that were in turns mocking and voluptuous. My heart stood still within me, every hair rose up erect, my flesh crept with horror. I could not see the grave and tender Lucy, my eyes were fascinated by the creature beyond. I know not why, but I put out my hand to clutch it, I grasped nothing but empty air, and my whole blood curdled to ice. For a moment I could not see, then my sight came back, and I saw Lucy standing before me, alone, deathly pale, and, I could have fancied, almost, shrunk in size. It has been near me? She said, as if asking a question. The sound seemed taken out of her voice, it was husky as the notes on an old harpsichord when the strings have ceased to vibrate. She read her answer in my face, I suppose, for I could not speak. Her look was one of intense fear, but that died away into an aspect of most humble patience. At length she seemed to force herself to face behind and around her, she saw the purple moors, the blue distant hills, quivering in the sunlight, but nothing else. Will you take me home? She said, meekly. I took her by the hand, and led her silently through the budding heather, we dared not speak, for we could not tell but that the dread creature was listening, although unseen, but that, it might appear and push us asunder. I never loved her more fondly than now when, and that was the unspeakable misery, the idea of her was becoming so inextricably blended with the shuddering thought of it. She seemed to understand what I must be feeling. She let go my hand, which she had kept clasped until then, when we reached the garden gate, and went forwards to meet her anxious friend, who was standing by the window looking for her. I could not enter the house, I needed silence, society, leisure, change, I knew not what, to shake off the sensation of that creature's presence. Yet I lingered about the garden, I hardly know why, I partly suppose, because I feared to encounter the resemblance again on the solitary common, where, it had vanished, and partly from a feeling of inexpressible compassion for Lucy. In a few minutes Mistress Clark came forth and joined me. We walked some paces in silence. You know all now, said she, solemnly. I saw it, it, said I, below my breath. And you shrink from us, now, she said, with a hopelessness which stirred up all that was brave or good in me. Not a whit, said I. Human flesh shrinks from encounter with the powers of darkness, and, for some reason unknown to me, the pure and holy Lucy is their victim. The sins of the fathers shall be visited upon the children, she said. Who is her father? asked I. Knowing as much as I do, I may surely know more, know all. Tell me, I entreat you, madam, all that you can conjecture respecting this demoniac persecution of one so good. I will, but not now. I must go to Lucy now. Come this afternoon, I'll see you alone, and oh, sir. I will trust that you may yet find some way to help us in our sore trouble. I was miserably exhausted by the swooning of fright which had taken possession of me. When I reached the inn, I staggered in like one overcome by wine. I went to my own private room. It was some time before I saw that the weekly post had come in, and brought me my letters. There was one from my uncle, one from my home in Devonshire, and one, redirected over the first address, sealed with a great coat of arms, it was from Sir Philip Tempest, my letter of inquiry respecting Mary Fitzgerald had reached him at Liege, where it so happened that the Count de la Tour d'Auvergne was quartered at the very time. He remembered his wife's beautiful attendant, she had had high words with the deceased Countess, respecting her intercourse with an English gentleman of good standing, who was also in the foreign service. The Countess augured evil of his intentions, while Mary, proud and vehement, asserted that he would soon marry her, and resented her mistress's warnings as an insult. The consequence was, that she had left Madame, de la Tour d'Auvergne's service, and, as the Count believed, had gone to live with the Englishman, whether he had married her or not, he could not say. But, added Sir Philip Tempest, you may easily hear what particulars you wish to know respecting Mary Fitzgerald from the Englishman himself, if, as I suspect, he is no other than my neighbour and former acquaintance, Mr. Gisborne, of Skipford Hall, in the West Riding. I am led to the belief that he is no other, by several small particulars, none of which are in themselves conclusive, but which, taken together, furnish a mass of presumptive evidence. As far as I could make out from the Count's foreign pronunciation, Gisborne was the name of the Englishman. I know that Gisborne of Skipford was abroad and in the foreign service at that time, he was a likely fellow enough for such an exploit, and, above all, certain expressions recur to my mind which he used in reference to old Bridget Fitzgerald, of Coldholm, whom he once encountered while staying with me at Starkey Manor House. I remember that the meeting seemed to have produced some extraordinary effect upon his mind, as though he had suddenly discovered some connection which she might have had with his previous life. 
I beg you to let me know if I can be of any further service to you. Your uncle once rendered me a good turn, and I will gladly repay it, so far as in me lies, to his nephew. I was now apparently close on the discovery which I had striven so many months to attain. But success had lost its zest. I put my letters down, and seemed to forget them all in thinking of the morning I had passed that very day. Nothing was real but the unreal presence, which had come like an evil blast across my bodily eyes, and burned itself down upon my brain. Dinner came, and went away untouched. Early in the afternoon I walked to the farmhouse. I found Mistress Clark alone, and I was glad and relieved. She was evidently prepared to tell me all I might wish to hear. You ask me for Mistress Lucy's true name, it is Gisborne she began. Not Gisborne of Skipford. I exclaimed, breathless with anticipation. The same, said she, quietly not regarding my manner. Her father is a man of note, although, being a Roman Catholic, he cannot take that rank in this country to which his station entitles him. The consequence is that he lives much abroad, has been a soldier, I am told. And Lucy's mother? I asked. She shook her head. I never knew her, said she. Lucy was about three years old when I was engaged to take charge of her. Her mother was dead. But you know her name? You can tell if it was Mary Fitzgerald. She looked astonished. That was her name. But, sir, how came you to be so well acquainted with it? It was a mystery to the whole household at Skipford Court. She was some beautiful young woman whom he lured away from her protectors while he was abroad. I have heard said he practiced some terrible deceit upon her, and when she came to know it, she was neither to have nor to hold, but rushed off from his very arms, and threw herself into a rapid stream and was drowned. It stung him deep with remorse, but I used to think the remembrance of the mother's cruel death made him love the child yet dearer. I told her, as briefly as might be, of my researches after the descendant and heir of the Fitzgeralds of Kildoon, and added, something of my old lawyer spirit returning into me for the moment, that I had no doubt but that we should prove Lucy to be by right possessed of large estates in Ireland. No flush came over her grey face, no light into her eyes. And what is all the wealth in the whole world to that poor girl? She said. It will not free her from the ghastly bewitchment which persecutes her. As for money, what a pitiful thing it is. It cannot touch her. No more can the evil creature harm her, I said. Her holy nature dwells apart, and cannot be defiled or stained by all the devilish arts in the whole world. True. But it is a cruel fate to know that all shrink from her, sooner or later, as from one possessed, accursed. How came it to pass? I asked. Nay, I know not. Old rumors there are, that were brooded through the household at Skipford. Tell me, I demanded. They came from servants, who would fain account for everything. They say that, many years ago, Mr. Gisborne killed a dog belonging to an old witch at Coldholm, that she cursed, with a dreadful and mysterious curse, the creature, whatever it might be, that he should love best, and that it struck so deeply into his heart that for years he kept himself aloof from any temptation to love aught. But who could help loving Lucy? You never heard the witch's name? I gasped. Yes, they called her Bridget, they said he would never go near the spot again for terror of her. Yet he was a brave man. Listen, said I, taking hold of her arm, the better to arrest her full attention, if what I suspect holds true, that man stole Bridget's only child, the very Mary Fitzgerald who was Lucy's mother, if so, Bridget cursed him in ignorance of the deeper wrong he had done her. To this hour she yearns after her lost child, and questions the saints whether she be living or not. The roots of that curse lie deeper than she knows, she unwittingly banned him for a deeper guilt than that of killing a dumb beast. The sins of the fathers are indeed visited upon the children. But, said Mistress Clark, eagerly, she would never let evil rest on her own grandchild. Surely, sir, if what you say be true, there are hopes for Lucy. Let us go, go at once, and tell this fearful woman all that you suspect, and beseech her to take off the spell she has put upon her innocent grandchild. It seemed to me, indeed, that something like this was the best course we could pursue. But first it was necessary to ascertain more than what mere rumor or careless hearsay could tell. My thoughts turned to my uncle, he could advise me wisely, he ought to know all. I resolved to go to him without delay, but I did not choose to tell Mistress Clark of all the visionary plans that flitted through my mind. I simply declared my intention of proceeding straight to London on Lucy's affairs. I bade her believe that my interest on the young lady's behalf was greater than ever, and that my whole time should be given up to her cause. I saw that Mistress Clark distrusted me, because my mind was too full of thoughts for my words to flow freely. She sighed and shook her head, and said, well, it is all right in such a tone that it was an implied reproach. But I was firm and constant in my heart, and I took confidence from that. I rode to London. 
I rode long days drawn out into the lovely summer nights, I could not rest. I reached London. I told my uncle all, though in the stir of the great city the horror had faded away, and I could hardly imagine that he would believe the account I gave him of the fearful double of Lucy which I had seen on the lonely moorside. But my uncle had lived many years, and learnt many things, and, in the deep secrets of family history that had been confided to him, he had heard of cases of innocent people bewitched and taken possession of by evil spirits yet more fearful than Lucy's. For, as he said, to judge from all I told him, that resemblance had no power over her, she was too pure and good to be tainted by its evil, haunting presence. It had, in all probability, so my uncle conceived, tried to suggest wicked thoughts and to tempt to wicked actions but she, in her saintly maidenhood, had passed on undefiled by evil thought or deed. It could not touch her soul, but true, it set her apart from all sweet love or common human intercourse. My uncle threw himself with an energy more like six and twenty than sixty into the consideration of the whole case. He undertook the proving Lucy's descent, and volunteered to go and find out Mr. Gisborne, and obtain, firstly, the legal proofs of her descent from the Fitzgeralds of Kildoon, and, secondly, to try and hear all that he could respecting the working of the curse, and whether any and what means had been taken to exorcise that terrible appearance. For he told me of instances where, by prayers and long fasting, the evil possessor had been driven forth with howling and many cries from the body which it had come to inhabit, he spoke of those strange New England cases which had happened not so long before, of Mr. Defoe, who had written a book, wherein he had named many modes of subduing apparitions, and sending them back whence they came, and, lastly, he spoke low of dreadful ways of compelling witches to undo their witchcraft. But I could not endure to hear of those tortures and burnings. I said that Bridget was rather a wild and savage woman than a malignant witch, and, above all, that Lucy was of her kith and kin, and that, in putting her to the trial, by water or by fire, we should be torturing, it might be to the death, the ancestress of her we sought to redeem. My uncle thought a while, and then said, that in this last matter I was right, at any rate, it should not be tried, with his consent, till all other modes of remedy had failed, and he assented to my proposal that I should go myself and see Bridget, and tell her all. In accordance with this, I went down once more to the wayside and near Coldholm. It was late at night when I arrived there, and, while I supped, I inquired of the landlord more particulars as to Bridget's ways. Solitary and savage had been her life for many years. Wild and despotic were her words and manner to those few people who came across her path. The country folk did her imperious bidding, because they feared to disobey. If they pleased her, they prospered, if, on the contrary, they neglected or traversed her behests, misfortune, small or great, fell on them and theirs. It was not detestation so much as an indefinable terror that she excited. In the morning I went to see her. She was standing on the green outside her cottage, and received me with the sullen grandeur of a throneless queen. I read in her face that she recognized me, and that I was not unwelcome, but she stood silent till I had opened my errand. I have news of your daughter, said I, resolved to speak straight to all that I knew she felt of love, and not to spare her. She is dead. The stern figure scarcely trembled, but her hand sought the support of the doorpost. I knew that she was dead, said she, deep and low, and then was silent for an instant. My tears that should have flowed for her were burnt up long years ago. Young man, tell me about her. Not yet, said I, having a strange power given me of confronting one, whom, nevertheless, in my secret soul I dreaded. You had once a little dog, I continued. The words called out in her more show of emotion than the intelligence of her daughter's death. She broke in upon my speech. I had. It was hers, the last thing I had of hers, and it was shot for wantonness. It died in my arms. The man who killed the dog ruse it to this day. For that dumb beast's blood, his best beloved stands accursed. Her eyes distended, as if she were in a trance and saw the working of her curse. Again I spoke. Oh, woman. I said, that best beloved, standing accursed before men, is your dead daughter's child. The life, the energy, the passion, came back to the eyes with which she pierced through me, to see if I spoke truth, then, without another question or word, she threw herself on the ground with fearful vehemence, and clutched at the innocent daisies with convulsed hands. Bone of my bone! Flesh of my flesh! Have I cursed thee, and art thou accursed? So she moaned, as she lay prostrate in her great agony. I stood aghast at my own work. She did not hear my broken sentences, she asked no more, but the dumb confirmation which my sad looks had given that one fact, that her curse rested on her own daughter's child. The fear grew on me lest she should die in her strife of body and soul, and then might not Lucy remain under the spell as long as she lived. Even at this moment, I saw Lucy coming through the woodland path that led to Bridget's cottage, Mistress Clark was with her, 
I felt at my heart that it was she, by the balmy peace which the look of her sent over me, as she slowly advanced, a glad surprise shining out of her soft quiet eyes. That was as her gaze met mine. As her looks fell on the woman lying stiff, convulsed on the earth, they became full of tender pity, and she came forward to try and lift her up. Seating herself on the turf, she took Bridget's head into her lap, and, with gentle touches, she arranged the disheveled grey hair streaming thick and wild from beneath her much. God help her! murmured Lucy. How she suffers! At her desire we sought for water, but when we returned, Bridget had recovered her wandering senses, and was kneeling with clasped hands before Lucy, gazing at that sweet sad face as though her troubled nature drank in health and peace from every moment's contemplation. A faint tinge on Lucy's pale cheeks showed me that she was aware of our return, otherwise it appeared as if she was conscious of her influence for good over the passionate and troubled woman kneeling before her, and would not willingly avert her grave and loving eyes from that wrinkled and careworn countenance. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, the creature appeared, there, behind Lucy, fearfully the same as to outward semblance, but kneeling exactly as Bridget knelt, and clasping her hands in jesting mimicry as Bridget clasped hers in her ecstasy that was deepening into a prayer. Mistress Clark cried out, Bridget arose slowly, her gaze fixed on the creature beyond, drawing her breath with a hissing sound, never moving her terrible eyes, that were steady as stone, she made a dart at the phantom, and caught, as I had done, a mere handful of empty air. We saw no more of the creature, it vanished as suddenly as it came, but Bridget looked slowly on, as if watching some receding form. Lucy sat still, white, trembling, drooping, I think she would have swooned if I had not been there to uphold her. While I was attending to her, Bridget passed us, without a word to any one, and, entering her cottage, she barred herself in, and left us without. All our endeavours were now directed to get Lucy back to the house where she had tarried the night before. Mistress Clark told me that, not hearing from me, some letter must have miscarried, she had grown impatient and despairing, and had urged Lucy to the enterprise of coming to seek her grandmother, not telling her, indeed, of the dread reputation she possessed, or how we suspected her of having so fearfully blighted that innocent girl, but, at the same time, hoping much from the mysterious stirring of blood, which Mistress Clark trusted in for the removal of the curse. They had come, by a different route from that which I had taken, to a village in not far from Coldholm, only the night before. This was the first interview between ancestress and descendant. All through the sultry noon I wandered along the tangled brushwood of the old neglected forest, thinking where to turn for remedy in a matter so complicated and mysterious. Meeting a countryman, I asked my way to the nearest clergyman, and went, hoping to obtain some counsel from him. But he proved to be a coarse and common-minded man, giving no time or attention to the intricacies of a case, but dashing out a strong opinion involving immediate action. For instance, as soon as I named Bridget Fitzgerald, he exclaimed. The cold home witch. The Irish papist. I'd have had her duck long since but for that other papist, Sir Philip Tempest. He has had to threaten honest folk about here over and over again, or they'd have had her up before the justices for her black doings and, it's the law of the land that witches should be burnt. A and of scripture, too, sir. Yet you see a papist, if he's a rich squire, can overrule both law and scripture. I'd carry a faggot myself to rid the country of her. Such a one could give me no help. I rather drew back what I had already said, and tried to make the parson forget it, by treating him to several pots of beer, in the village inn, to which we had adjourned for our conference at his suggestion. I left him as soon as I could, and returned to cold home, shaping my way past deserted Starkey Manor House, and coming upon it by the back. At that side were the oblong remains of the old moat, the waters of which lay placid and motionless under the crimson rays of the setting sun, with the forest trees lying straight along each side, and the deep green foliage mirrored to blackness in the burnished surface of the moat below, and the broken sundial at the end nearest the hall, and the heron, standing on one leg at the water's edge, lazily looking down for fish, the lonely and desolate house scarce needed the broken windows, the weeds on the door sill, the broken shutter softly flapping to and fro in the twilight breeze, to fill up the picture of desertion and decay. I lingered about the place until the growing darkness warned me on. And then I passed along the path, cut by the orders of the last lady of Starkey Manor House, that led me to Bridget's cottage. I resolved at once to see her, and, in spite of closed doors, it might be of resolved will, she should see me. So I knocked at her door, gently, loudly, fiercely, I shook it so vehemently that a length the old hinges gave way, and with a crash it fell inwards, leaving me suddenly face to face with Bridget, I, red, heated, agitated with my so long baffled efforts, she, stiff as any stone, standing right facing me, her eyes dilated with terror, her ashen lips trembling, but her body motionless. In her hands she held her crucifix, as if by that holy symbol she sought to oppose my entrance. At sight of me, 
her whole frame relaxed, and she sank back upon a chair. Some mighty tension had given way. Still her eyes looked fearfully into the gloom of the outer air, made more opaque by the glimmer of the lamp inside, which she had placed before the picture of the Virgin. Is she there? Asked Bridget, hoarsely. No. Who? I am alone. You remember me? Yes, replied she, still terror-stricken. But she, that creature, has been looking in upon me through that window all day long. I closed it up with my shawl, and then I saw her feet below the door, as long as it was light, and I knew she heard my very breathing, nay, worse, my very prayers, and I could not pray, for her listening choked the words ere they rose to my lips. Tell me, who's she? What means that double girl I saw this morning? One had a look of my dead Mary, but the other curdled my blood, and yet it was the same. She had taken hold of my arm, as if to secure herself some human companionship. She shook all over with the slight, never-ceasing tremor of intense terror. I told her my tale as I have told it you, sparing none of the details. How Mistress Clark had informed me that the resemblance had driven Lucy forth from her father's house, how I had disbelieved, until, with mine own eyes, I had seen another Lucy standing behind my Lucy, the same in form and feature, but with a demon soul looking out of the eyes. I told her all, I say, believing that she, whose curse was working so upon the life of her innocent grandchild, was the only person who could find the remedy and the redemption. When I had done, she sat silent for many minutes. You love Mary's child? She asked. I do, in spite of the fearful working of the curse, I love her. Yet I shrink from her ever since that day on the moor side. And men must shrink from one so accompanied, friends and lovers must stand afar off. Oh, Bridget Fitzgerald. Loosen the curse. Set her free. Where is she? I eagerly caught at the idea that her presence was needed, in order that, by some strange prayer or exorcism, the spell might be reversed. I will go and bring her to you, I exclaimed. Bridget tightened her hold upon my arm. Not so, said she, in a low, hoarse voice. It would kill me to see her again as I saw her this morning. And I must live till I have worked my work. Leave me, said she, suddenly, and again taking up the cross. I defy the demon I have called up. Leave me to wrestle with it. She stood up, as if in an ecstasy of inspiration, from which all fear was banished. I lingered, why I can hardly tell, until once more she bade me be gone. As I went along the forest way, I looked back, and saw her planting the cross in the empty threshold, where the door had been. The next morning Lucy and I went to seek her, to bid her join her prayers with ours. The cottage stood open and wide to our gaze. No human being was there, the cross remained on the threshold, but Bridget was gone. 